file team. I'll request Jyoti Kamal ji to welcome our panelists for the next session. Alia Sultana Babi, dinosaur princess from Gujarat, or as she is known as Dr. Dinosaur. And Malika Singh Dundlod from Baisa's Adventures. Princess Alia Sultana Babi, the dinosaur princess, is the daughter of the late Nawab of Balasanor who has been advocating for the protection and preservation of the rare dinosaur fossil site in Raioli near Balasinor. Converting her family home, the royal palace and a heritage homestay, she has been successful in bringing recognition for the site. And daughter of the royal Rajput family, Malika Singh leads Marwadi horse safaris in the Shekhawati region in Rajasthan. The indigenous Marwadi horse was revived by her father in 1985 by starting the horse safaris and she took it a step ahead by founding Baisa's Adventures. Let us begin with the session. Over to you, Jyoti Kamal. Thank you, Ashi. Thank you so much. Alia, starting with you. Ji. Uh, an unknown fact, or maybe some people know it, uh, Parveen Babi is from your dynasty, the famous actor. And um, your dynasty, of course, comes from Afghanistan and then kind of the Babis settled down in this area of uh, northwestern India and kind of made their strongholds there. How did you kind of uh, really go from being somebody associated closely with royalty to actually making sure that dinosaurs in India get preserved? Because uh, in Balasinor, that area that you come from, Rayoli, that village, there is this anecdote uh, that is often recounted that you were kind of passing by and there were these flavorsome aromas coming from a hut there and you kind of go in and there is this one lady who's known for her cooking, who's cooking something really yummy out there and then you look at uh, a mortar and a pestle that she's using to kind of grind the spices and then when you look at the pestle, you see that it's an odd shape, it's like oval and it's got dots on it and then you suddenly realize that it's probably a dinosaur egg and you wanted that, but they wouldn't want to part with it till the time that you had to exchange a royal utensil with them <laughs> and then they gave you that egg in return and that's how you kind of got that dinosaur fossil with you. And this is the Rajasaurus narmadensis that uh, kind of is in that area. But how did you kind of uh, traverse this journey of being a princess to actually making sure that dinosaur fossils are preserved in the Balasinor area of Gujarat, where you come from. Uh, first and foremost, good evening, Namaskar. Thank you, News 18, for having me here. Our pleasure. Um, yes, I come from Balasinor, which is one of its kind dinosaur region, and it is considered to be the world's third largest hatchery. So we are in the top three, which for us Indians, it's a very proud moment. And um, how I came about in it is also, I was pushed into it by one of my media friends, that you must do something for the preservation of these fossils, because India has a lot to offer, but we Indians are not aware. And this is what I wanted every Indian to know what all India has to offer. And uh, today, um, after a long and arduous struggle of more than 27 years, we have a fantastic museum solely for dinosaurs in a tiny little village of Rayoli, which was not even on the world map. And um, when we have tourists visiting our place, you ask any child, what's your favorite dinosaur? They say T-Rex. Because they have been exposed to the world of T-Rex through the movies, the, Bollywood, the Hollywood movies. But do any one of us know that there are Indian dinosaurs with Indian names? I'm sure none of you know that. But there are more than 30 dinosaurs from India. One is named after Rabindranath Tagore. One is named after the Kota Formation of Rocks. And the tiny little, of, uh, tiny little village of Rayoli also has a dinosaur named after it called Rayoli Saurus Gujaratensis. So it has Rayoli as well as Gujarat in it. And the king of all the dinosaurs in India is the Rajasaurus Narmadensis which had a horn on its head, which looked like a crown. So it's just a wee bit of an effort that I made to popularize the dinosaurs in India, because I felt, yes, today's generation needs to know about it. And um, uh, I wanted to, uh, to create something called dino tourism. 
you know, you have temple tourism, you have beach tourism, you have wildlife tourism. And especially after these movies, I created something called Dino Tourism. And um, today the Dinosaur Museum is visited by thousands of people from all over the world. And I'm very proud of what I have managed to achieve for the tiny little village. And more, um, I'm proud because I, through the Gujarat tourism, we have managed to give employment to the local people. So that I feel is my biggest achievement. And when you come back to the egg, the interesting story, yes, um, I found this egg with a village woman and she was using it to grind her masala. Little did she know that in reality it was a dinosaur egg. Because even today when you go to the rural, rural areas, you don't find mixers and grinders in most of the homes. They use a mortar and a pestle, silbatta. And this egg, particular egg, was covered with chilies. So I very lovingly gave it a name, Masala Anda, <laughs> which is in my possession. And uh, Smithsonian did a fantastic story on the fossils that I have, the fossil site, and about my family. So was this Rajasaurus a big dinosaur? Because I've seen images of it. It looked like a Tyrannosaurus, but a smaller version of it. Um, we, uh, we call it the Indian cousin of the T-Rex. Um, it had a horn on its head, which was the most distingu uh, distinguishing feature. Um, it was approximately 30 feet in length and weighed approximately uh, 4,000 kilos. But uh, the recent research says that it had a more ferocious grip much more than the T-Rex. So it was an ambush predator. So yes, when the tourists visit the museum and do, they do a tour with me, I definitely managed to change the mindset of the children. And instead of loving the T-Rex, the they start loving the Rajasaurus. <laughs> Great. And in fact, the name itself is the royalty of dinosaurs, Rajasaurus, probably because of the uh, crown that it had. For two on reasons. It. First mm -hmm. and foremost, because it came, uh, it had a horn on its head, which looked like a crown. And secondly, possibly, I'm not too sure about that, but I would like to say, because it came from the princely state of Balasinor, <laughs> that is why mighty king of the Narmada. But um, uh, scientifically speaking, every naming of a prehistoric creature has a significance. The I'll, region it was found or who founded it. Right. Yeah. I'll come back to you for uh, uh, another bit of kind of dinosaur trivia that's there in that region, which is a snake that was also found, which... Uh, used to kind of eat up dinosaur eggs and like that was a non-dinosaur snake predator, predator of dinosaurs. Some Indicus, I f forget its name. But I'll come back to you for that. Uh, going to Malika. Malika. Good evening. Most, yes, good evening. <laughs> and thank you so much for, I mean, a very different outfit uh, in terms of uh, what you do in terms of preserving the Marwari war horse. The most famous of them all, of course, is Chetak. When we kind of yes, talk about uh, a war horse in India, it was Chetak, Maharaja Pratap's, Maharana Pratap's uh, war horse. And eventually, they kind of started losing their uh, kind of value in folklore and general presence till the time that your father really decided that the war horses had to be kind of preserved. And that's when the tourism started. That's when the safaris started. Yes. What kind of a war horse was the Marwari or is the Marwari war, war horse? Okay, uh, so Kamagani to everyone and thank you for having me here. Our pleasure. So uh, the Marwari horse is, I'm not too loud, right? Because my voice is already husky. <laughs> no, perfect. Okay, so the Marwari horses are very well known as uh, war horses. But um, as you said, after the Britishers invaded and you know, a certain time they were sort of getting lesser known. And um, they, yes, they are very much read by our children and by all of us when we were in school in the history. But people started knowing more about polo and the thoroughbreds. And at some point, you know, the Marwari horses were not known. And I would say even now the journey carries on. In 1985, my father decided to revive the breed. It was actually just out of his passion. He bought a batch of 25 horses, which was in Jaipur. It was in our ancestral home known as Dunlod House. And uh, those days, you know, there was some information about it in South Africa that safaris like this take place. So he thought that why not take this forward? So we started doing horse safaris, which was a way for uh, equestrians from all over the world to come and experience India mounted on the horse. And of course, it, uh, it was something which, you know, began as uh, his own passion to revive the breed. 
and then we realized that people from all over the world really appreciated it they wanted to know about the unique war horse and so and so forth the you know there were times when we used to be like we used to my father used to be 6 months on a horse like from all the way to october to march and then we have off season now uh, coming back to me looking at this since i was 13 i guess i would say it also came genetically and uh, when you are around uh, you know a family where someone is so involved in horses it automatically becomes you know a part of your life so yes <laughs> Yeah, but when you look at these war horses now, uh, they are in this safari that you run, and it's an amazing experience that you offer in that whole Shekhawati region um, of Rajasthan. And people come; they do not know riding, and then they have to figure out how to ride this horse. And then, but after they figure it out, it's a magical experience of actually going out for two-day safaris on horseback. How did how did you kind of really make all of this work? And are people afraid of kind of learning to ride a horse for the first time? these are war horses i mean in one's imagination they come across as kind of uh, war horses yes. really so i mean how how did you kind of blend the two this whole safari thing people not knowing how to ride horses getting them to really mount the horses getting them to form a bond with the horses and then actually taking them out there how does this whole process work like if suppose one amongst us who doesn't know horse riding turned up uh, for your safari how would it work will we get to ride the horses Yes yes so uh, there are two things to your question so i'll have to answer it separately firstly when we hear about the marwari horse like we know it's the war horse but there are many more features about it it's extremely sensitive it's extremely loyal and uh, it's very spirited a lot of times people imagine that you know this horse is something which they may not be able to ride so there are two kinds of things when we are talking about long equestrian rides it has to be equestrians which are experienced we will never let anyone mount a horse who does not know riding and that to somebody who we have different levels it has to be intermediate or in advance because you are going ahead you know on you are literally like 7 days on a horse pack you are finishing 25 to 30 kilometers so that is one part of the business now the second thing is baisa's adventures happened in 2019 because i myself been on horse safaris with my father and i wanted to open the world of marwari horses to everyone it was my uh, wish that uh, you know everyone should experience what we feel and i created this experience called bonding with horses it's something which has really come about well it's about ghode ghode walon ko samajh aayega jo hamare grooms karte hain it is all about getting to know the horse in india everybody is very spoiled people come here and they go to a stable and they just mount a horse and go so this is not only for non equestrians it's for equestrians also jab tak aap apne animal ko samjhoge nahi how are you going to spend the next 6 days with the horse they need to get to know you and you need to get to know them so because of that this idea came to me that why don't we create this for people who don't know how to ride so we created an experience where they could come and brush the horse get to know how to put a saddle you know simple stuff a lot of touches involved and everybody who likes animals will love this experience because you are getting also it's very therapeutic it's extremely in interesting to be around an animal people do feel that it's a bigger animal so they tend to you know sort of have different ways of dealing with it i just let it go on and carry it on as the comfort of the person who's right there there is no time limit to it there are people who end up wanting to be with the horse for a way longer time there are people who end up saying that look we would just like to watch you know the person next to us could go ahead so you get a basic lesson of how to put a saddle we get you to mount the horse and a basic lesson on the posture and the little start of how it is to go riding i've had people who've come back to me and said that we want to join a club we are going to get to ride now and eventually when we sort of get somewhere we may want to come back to you so this is just a small way to sort of get them to experience how it feels to be with you know a marwari horse and not anything to do with knowing how to ride so that's it thank you so much palika it's it's so amazing that people like you and alia who have been associated with royalty and uh, absolute high ends of luxury and everything really kind of make sure that those communities where you kind of have your ancestral places where you have your family homes people around are also a part of your initiatives now 
they become an absolute part of that ecosystem that people like you who have taken the initiative have created. You're offering an experience to people and along with it, you're offering a livelihood to people who are kind of in that area. So Alia, in fact, you have started your own line also called Alia. So, which has got a lot of these people from that area feeding into it. So how, how did you kind of decide that, okay, this is how I'm going to make it all work together so that it becomes a viable business model for everyone. And thereafter, you can really focus on what you want to do, which is taking care of the dinosaur fossils. Because a lot of that area still gets vandalized, despite the fact that it has such a rich uh, presence of uh, fossils there. They're all over, literally. Like, like you were talking about Smithsonian. In Smithsonian, again, there was this description that you actually stand up on a slightly raised hill, and then you kind of describe and ask, what, what, do, you, what do you see there? So people say that we just see some rocks, bushes, and stuff. And then you say, no. That's the head of the dinosaur, that's the body of the dinosaur, that's where the tail starts and goes, whatever fragments are available there. So similarly, there are dinosaurs all over the place and fossils everywhere. So do you find it a challenge in terms of how these fossil parks are not really that well cared for? There are these fossils that are there, you have kind of filled that gap there. And that ecosystem that I was talking about, that whole business ecosystem, which can help sustain and support all of this. As I said earlier, uh, I created something called Dino Tourism. So actually my parents were the pioneers who started um, the Heritage Homestay, which is called the Garden Palace Heritage Homestay in Balasanor. So we started with just uh, one renovated room. And at that time, I think Gujarat was not even on the tourist map, um, uh, seeing to our neighboring state of Rajasthan where it was like every tourist wants to go to Rajasthan, but no one wanted to come to Gujarat. So when we started our place as a heritage hotel, what do you offer the tourists? Um, of course, Gujarat is very rich in terms of arts and crafts and all, but that is more or less in Kutch and the other areas. So when it came to Balasanor, what were we going to offer the tourists? The dinosaur site was discovered in 1980s, but as I said, um, not much was done about it. And um, the second famous thing of Balasanor is the cuisine, which my mother tried to revive. And this is not Mughlai cuisine. We call it the signature Balasanori cuisine. So my mother was um, um, teaching the cooks, teaching the chefs the recipes which she had inherited from her families or from the other families, whether they were our own families or the other royalties. And she, in her own way, through uh, hosting food festivals across India in five-star hotels, be it uh, the, uh, the Taj or the, you know, the Grand Maratha and all. She was showcasing the cuisine of Balasanor to the world. And these were all age-old recipes. And the same kind of food we are serving our guests uh, at the Garden Palace Heritage Hotel. Of course, now my mother has retired and this, uh, the, she's passed the baton on to my brother and my sister-in-law. And um, in this way, uh, when you try to revive the cuisine, you are also giving employment to the locals, be it the chefs, be it the waiters, the, head, uh, you know, the room boys, or you get the mu local musicians. So we also played host to Maharaja's Express, which is a super luxury train. And uh, it came to Balasanor for nearly eight years. And I think um, Balasnor was the only destination in Gujarat. And we were giving them a traditional welcome. So how were the locals benefited? They were the Shenaiwalas, they were the Dolis. So they were getting employment. We had the dancers, we, uh, we had the Siddhi Dhamal dancers who were performing for them. And uh, this is how, even this is what is happening today also for any tourist who wants to have this kind of an experience. You want to learn cooking? As Siddharth Daspa said, we also do that. You want to learn a traditional cuisine, we will do that for you. So this way we are trying to um, revive our heritage and maintain it for the future generation. India is such an amazing country. The idea of getting you all to kind of join us for events like this is to kind of actually showcase what all is happening in India. You, you as a dynasty come from Afghanistan and you come to Gujarat and then you just mentioned the Siddhi dancers. The Siddhi dancers were slaves who were brought in by the Portuguese from Africa. And now they and have kind of... also by the Nawabs of Junagar. By the Nawabs of Who were my ancestors. Junagar. Yes, absolutely. They have also become such an integral part of society, these Africans and royalty from Afghanistan, and then the Maharaja Express coming in, and people, so, so much is going on in India. 
Malika, uh, another uh, quick question for you before we wrap up. Uh, Marwari war, war horses, you are kind of using them or you are kind of really being able to take care of them because they have become a part of the safari tourism circuit there. Then you have other race horses which are also bred for racing. So there are the breeders, there are the racers, and then there are the safaris. So do you see horse numbers in India rising? Do you see the horse having a good future uh, that will kind of gallop into? Or do you see horses numbers going down in India? In Punjab, you specifically have the Nihangs who really take care of the horses and uh, they kind of make sure that horses in Punjab are kept alive. But are you seeing numbers increasing, dwindling? What's happening to horses in India? So I very much see that the numbers are increasing. I mean, I wouldn't even like to put it like that because there's a whole world out there for Marwari horses today. And we are proud to say that it's because of the hard work of many of our elders who have been passionate about the Marwari horses. And that is the reason we are here today. It's completely different when we talk about races, when we talk about sports, when we talk about polo, and we talk about safaris. Each one has its own importance. And uh, all I could throw light on is that Marwari horses are extremely well known for tent pegging. It's one of the sports we take part in. We are very well known also for the endurance. In fact, uh, my first endurance was a 40 kilometer. It was with my father. We were in a group of four. And uh, I got my first gold medal in endurance nationals. And I would say it's not because of my hard work. I would say it was 20% mine and 80% my horse. So there is a whole world out there where the horses are taking us. I would like to personally say that, uh, in fact, my uncle, Colonel Salpratap, he's here in the, um, uh, you know, in the <laughs> people here. Yeah. And he has a stable called The Stables. And he is really uh, fiercely, uh, you know, taking jumping also for the Marwari horses. And uh, that is something which I'm interested in also. I'm also interested in dressage for the Marwari horses. So there is nothing which is not possible for the horse. It's just that they are differently trained. So you cannot have a safari horse which will also do a jumping. But that's about it. The journey from here, I would say, is just only begun. <laughs> Thank you so much. In fact, you spoke about endurance. A little known fact that uh, an animal that can outrun horses in endurance, in long distance, is the human being. So humans can actually run, outrun horses on a continuous stretch. Uh, so that's like um, a little known fact. But thank you so much, Malika. Thank you so much, Alia, for being a part of this evening and joining us here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alia. Thank you, Malika. Thank you, Jyoti Kamalji. Please stay on the stage. I'll now request uh, News 18 India editor to felicitate our panelists, Alia Sultana Babi, Dr. Dinosaur. And Malika Singh Dunlod from Baisa's Adventures. Thank you, Alia. Thank you, Malika. I now request Jyoti Kamalji to please stay on the stage. 